CBS News projects that Reverend Raphael Warnock is the winner of his runoff race, becoming Georgia's first black United States senator. And every day I'm in the United States Senate, I will fight for you. I will fight for your family. Meanwhile, his opponent, Senator Kelly Leffler, has not conceded the race. And as last votes are counted, John Ossoff continues to inch ahead of incumbent Republican Senator David Perdue. Here to break it all down are CBS News political analyst and Republican strategist Leslie Sanchez and CBS News political contributor and Democratic strategist Antoine Seawright. Uh, all right, so Senator-elect Warnock declared victory last night. Before our projection, I want to play a bit of his speech for our audience. I know that we can beat this pandemic with science and good old-fashioned common sense. I know we can rebuild a fairer economy by respecting the dignity of work and the workers who do it. An economy that honors those whom we now call essential workers by paying them an essential wage. So, Antoine, uh, let's talk about uh, Warnock and his team and how they were able to pull this out. But I'm more interested in the demographic shift that we are seeing in the state of Georgia. If John Ossoff is victorious, he will become the first Jewish senator from that state. Uh, obviously, we just mentioned uh, what uh, Raphael Warnock brings to the table. And I'm just curious because clearly when Governor Kemp picked uh, uh, Kelly Leffler to fill that seat, there was perhaps some thought that she might appeal to suburban women, college-educated women, uh, that the Republican Party had been losing over the last couple of years. It didn't seem to work, and now we're sort of seeing this seismic shift. The state went blue, it voted for Joe Biden, and now you have two Democrats representing the state in Georgia, one who is Jewish and one who's African-American. If, if Ossoff is victorious, I well, should point out. Well, Vlad, uh, I learned growing up that when people count you out, you teach them that they do not know how to count. And that's the story of Georgia in this election cycle. Look, only the American experiment can give you a Catholic president by the name of Joe Biden, a black woman presiding over the U.S. Senate named Kamala Harris, now the son of a sharecropping uh, mother. Uh, a black man from Georgia as the first black senator from the state of Georgia, and perhaps when it's all said and done, I have reason to believe uh, a Jewish man will also be the first Jewish man as U.S. senator from Georgia. Look, all of that is made possible by black voters, and that is because of the work that has been done for a very long time in the state of Georgia. We learned from our mistakes that we made on November 3rd in some places where we did not come across the finish line first. And what happened in Georgia since November 3rd was an increased effort uh, in the high touch uh, form of campaigning. It was a lot of door-to-door -door, uh, in the middle of a pandemic. It was making sure that low propensity voters, as the people in Washington, D.C. would describe them, I call them uninspired voters, show up. It was voters who perhaps were registered that did not show up on November 3rd, making sure they come back out. And once again, the coalition of young people and black people saved this little idea called America, and that is the storyline from Georgia. Um, as we pointed out, incumbent Senator Kelly uh, Leffler spoke last night. She has not conceded. Um, here's a clip of uh, what she had to say what her, at her campaign event. We got some work to do here. This is a game of inches. We're going to win this election. We're going to save this country. That's right. That's right. We're going to win Georgia and save America. Republican Senator David Perdue also released a statement last night saying that he will, quote, exhaust every legal resource to ensure all legally cast ballots will be properly counted. So, Leslie, this is a question for you. As I understand it, the, uh, the current margin um, when it comes to the Leffler-Warnock case, it's not small enough to trigger an automatic recount, but it looks razor thin when it comes to the other race. Are, are we headed back to court? Is this not going to end for weeks? 
That's hard to say, Anne-Marie, but I, I will tell you, on the Republican side, there's a lot of conversations about uh, kind of the changes that happened uh, in lieu of the pandemic, certainly in Georgia and other states, with absentee ballots, some of the rules that caused confusion, and then to some, they say they caused irregularities. That's why that common theme of ensuring that every ballot, you, you heard it in Purdue's statement, that every legitimate vote is counted. They want to just ensure that the people that had absentee, for example, are measured against the people that actually turned in the ballots, you know, that, that, that they're cross-examining that and sure every ballot vote is counted. You're going to hear a lot about that. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it goes on to, uh, to recounts and certainly a legal action, but that's what's going to happen when you have a, a series of too close to call elections. When they're this close, uh, it really does look like a continuation of what we saw in November, the same players, the same message, the same outcome. So that's why um, we can't expect much different in terms of process. Antoine, exit polls show 92% of black voters voted for John Ossoff and Senator-elect Warnock in their respective races, uh, and three-quarters of people who did not vote in November voted for Democrats. So what factors drove those voters to the polls this time around that did not motivate them a couple of months ago? Uh, it can't just be, you know, I, I'm, I'm really curious to understand if it was just a vote against Donald Trump or if they really thought that uh, Reverend Warnock uh, and his policy proposals were the right fit for Georgians. I think black people in particular were just sick and tired of being sick and tired. Keep in mind, Vlad, we're in the South, uh, where our votes as people of color, in particular black people, have been suppressed and depressed, uh, and people have tried to always put us in a mess for a very long time. And so when you have that and you figure out that government has not worked for you, and it's worked for everyone else besides you, you have to start to examine to say, well, why is that not possible? And I think black people have figured out uh, their net worth, and they've also figured out that you cannot govern if you do not win. And so showing up, as I said to you yesterday, was about survival in this election. And the muscle memory, I think, the political muscle memory from black voters in Georgia from 2018, when Stacey Abrams uh, did not come across the finish line first, and continuing to build upon those muscles to get to 2020 and now the 2020 runoff, all that has been a continuation of staying engaged, staying involved, and helping people realize the net worth of their vote and their participation. And the last thing I'll, I'll say is that I think collectively, Democrats have figured out the people who are impacted the most are those who show up the least. And when we participate, we win. When we do not, the other side, those who do not have our best interests at heart, have a chance to put us farther and farther behind. And I think that was scary for some people. And that's why I think you saw the surge among African-American voters and young voters that you saw in Georgia uh, last night for both, can both Democratic candidates. So let's see, John uh, Ossoff uh, is ahead of Senator David Perdue by, by a slim margin, as we pointed out. He made a virtual sort of address uh, earlier today, and he declared victory, but CBS News has not called a race at all. It's really too close at, at this point. But we know, Leslie, that for the Democratic Party, this was not just about Georgia or about, you know, power in the Senate. Those were certainly factors, but it's also about something a little bigger. It's about creating a blue wave uh, across many of these southern states. I'm wondering what is the mood on the Republican side right now? Is there a concern that over the past few years, a lot of this hard work and fundraising that um, some key members of the Democratic Party have been doing, people have been calling out Stacey Abrams a lot, um, that that this that we are seeing not just two successful races, perhaps, but also a, a wave that's being triggered? You know, it's interesting, Anne-Marie, there's a lot of frustration. You know, uh, you get on the phone and they're like, it's a bad day for Republicans. I mean, that's like a common thing. <laughs> Every phone call I've taken today, that's, you know, the common, the hand-wringing, dissecting. But let, let me tell you, the, the posture is, these are, these are a series, and I will keep going back to that, of it too close to call. These aren't massive referendums. This is not, for example, 1964, Lyndon Johnson, where he had super majorities in the House and the Senate, and they went on to do the Great Society. This is not Obama in 2008, you know, where he had the, the you know, pretty sizable majorities uh, going into his 24 months. This is a 24-month 
kind of reevaluation. This is where we're really going to see what happens. And because these margins are so small, uh, it's, I think it's still a lot more gridlock it's all, and, and as opposed to massive kind of the electorate coming and, and having a big referendum and a, and a message. Uh, there are significant majority, not majorities in this case, a significant pop, portion of the population that voted for the other side. So because of that, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. And Antoine and I, we laugh about it. You know, in our business, you only have to be right 51% of the time to be successful. That's, right. and that's <laughs> what you're seeing. So so we're, we're, this is not a, a big transformation yet, but it is kind of lining up to see demographic shifts technology shifts, the pandemic and, and kind of the pall that it had over the election and these candidates, you know, was everybody's going to want to blame Donald Trump, you know, but some will say he's this kind of shooting star. He had a lot of energy around him. He hits the atmosphere, which is, they would say, the establishment, you know, on both sides and it kind of, you know, burns out. But does this movement keep going? Those are questions we're really going to be diving into post-Georgia and kind of leading to uh, two years from now. You know, Leslie and Antoine, uh, I was reminded again yesterday of a tweet from Senator Lindsey Graham from back in 2016. Do you guys recall what Senator Graham tweeted about oh, yeah. electing Donald Trump? He said, if we elect Trump, we will get destroyed and we will deserve it. And I bring attention to that tweet again because... In the span of four years, the president has lost the presidency. He is potentially on the verge of losing the majority in the United States Senate. And, of course, the House majority uh, remains with the Democrats, um, although we should point out that Republicans did make some inroads uh, in the last election. Now, I bring that uh, tweet up of Lindsey Graham's because there's a really interesting op-ed today in the National Review, which both of you will know is a very conservative news magazine, and it was written by Kevin Williamson. And he, you know, he brings out a couple of points about the Republican party and I, I just want to read a little bit of our of this op-ed for our audience and I want to get you to react to it um, with regards to the folks who are challenging what we're expected to see on Capitol Hill today um, you, you, this is what he says um, there, I have on many, case, criti uh, many occasions criticized the abuse of the word coup in our politics, but that is what this is, an attempted coup d'etat under color of law. It would be entirely appropriate today to impeach Trump a second time and remove him from office before his term ends. He goes on to say in this op-end that the modern Republican Party, whatever it was, is gone, even if much of the staff and the incorporation papers remain. The Republican Party will have to undergo the political equivalent of one of those reality television makeovers if it ever wants to be called the party of Lincoln again. So, Leslie, what do you make of that? There are a lot of Republicans who are hand-wringing, and I guess the question that some will have is, was it worth it? Was it worth it to get those Supreme Court judges? Perhaps some people will say that it was. Uh, but Infrastructure Week never happened. Obamacare was never repealed. I haven't seen any evidence of a great big beautiful wall, and certainly Mexico hasn't paid for it. Our trade deficits are wider. China is stronger than it was in 2016. So for those Republicans who are still tethered to this president, was it worth it? And Antoine, what do you make of what Kevin Williamson had to write? Let me get Leslie's take first. Really quickly, there have been a lot of Republicans think this president had tremendous success, not only with over 200 federal judges, but also you're talking about the Supreme Court judges, deregulation on business, building back up the military, stronger stances internationally. Because remember, Trump was an outcome, and the populist cry for him was because of the Obama policies, of which Biden was a big part of. So the pushback, um, many feel, is breaking down a system that, that many feel Washington has failed them, both Republicans and Democrats, and an or, unorthodox candidate who broke up both sides. He had everybody kind of juggling around, and he continues to do that. That's a positive for many people because, you know, uh, they feel that the power is so corrupt um, and so corrupting and so corrosive to the system that something outside needs to come in and reform that and see what comes out, out of that. So this kind of rising phoenix, whatever it will be, of the Republican Party is going to be, hopefully, the best parts and aspects of, of realignment and reform. Vlad, I will tell you, can you imagine 
the hell people would be raising right now if this was the Democrats, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton behaving like this after an election loss, the world would go crazy and Republicans themselves would lose their minds about the behavior of Democrats if we behave that way. So what this tells me is that Republicans are now trying to recalibrate or trying to figure out how they're going to recalibrate and figure out who they are going to be when they grow up post Donald Trump. I don't know what that's going to look like. I'm not a Republican. I will not try to play one on TV this morning. But here's what I do know. <laughs> Democrats had to recalibrate after Barack Obama. And so we had to figure out who we were going to be when we grew up. Thankfully, we've come to know ourselves to be Joe Biden and Kamala Harris Democrats. What that's going to look like for the Republican Party is scary for me because what I see is a competition, a competition to try to out crazy Donald Trump and flirt uh, and play footsie with his kind of agenda. And I don't think that's good for the American experiment. So let me ask you, Leslie, you know, to what um, Vlad is talking about in regards to what's happening today on Capitol Hill, um, you know, it, these objections, and we don't know uh, how long this the whole thing is going to go on, but what we do know is that, that it's not going to make a difference at all, that the outcome of the election is right. already a done deal. Um, and, and so then... I, I got to ask you, you know, what's your take on the purpose behind this? Um, we're in the middle, middle of a pandemic. Um, people are dying at, at, at record numbers. The, the economy is in shambles. It, it's not the best look for Congress to be sort of participating in, in what is essentially kind of like, you know, a, a dog and pony show that's going to go on for hours and not change the outcome. Mm -hmm. why, why is this happening? Right. I have to go back to my history, Marie, but, you know, it's like Andrew Jackson, um, you know, people talk about uh, it, it's been so long since there's been this kind of skepticism, national skepticism of a big portion of the population about the outcome. And Congress does have, uh, you know, measures that they can take, and this is one of them. I agree with you that it's not going anywhere, but part of this process is, is, shaking out um, kind of these electoral irregularities, trying to show more transparency. And while it does look and sound like political posturing, it is more lining up where I think this country's going and where certainly the Republicans are going in terms of trying to, to show that there's, there's questions on many of these states. They want to bring transparency to that. And that's a fair argument. Um, should, is this the place to have it? They believe it is. Um, but I don't think overall, in terms of its effectiveness, I don't think this is where the Republicans are really going to make big gains. They're going to make big gains by going back and doing that autopsy of what happened in these states, how to continue to be competitive. And if anything, they're, they're, you're going to hear a lot more talk, and this isn't what, one of the things you mentioned about Mitch McConnell denying the $2,000, you know, the increase in stimulus for families. A lot of people are really upset about that and feel that he has a lot of the blame or mud on his boots, so to speak, if you're going to look at the Senate today. So yeah. um, I think that's more realistically where we are. Before we go, um, Antoine and Leslie and Anne-Marie, uh, you, you recall back in 2016, 2017, how many print pieces, mostly print, but there were some television pieces that you know, went to rural America, rural Pennsylvania, rural Ohio to try and understand the mind of the forgotten American, the the Trump voter, um, to understand, you know, what it was um, that uh, made them essentially go from what you said, Leslie, to establishment Republicans to a candidate like a reality TV show uh, host. And I wonder, I really do wonder if they're going to see the same for black Americans, for example, in the state of Georgia. Will there be dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of news reports, print pieces, think pieces that come out trying to understand the mind of the black uh, diner, um, uh, you know, uh, goer in Georgia um, or somebody who lives um, in the suburbs of Georgia? And, and I ask both of you this because, Leslie, you talk about an, an autopsy. There's clearly some work to be done by the Republican Party um, in the state of Georgia when it comes to African-American voters, when it comes to uh, brown voters, even perhaps when it, where it comes to, to Jewish American voters, if John Ossoff is successful. And Antoine, for you, I mean, you know, 
African Americans have come through each and every time for Democrats when they've been asked to do so. Now they're going to want to know what are the political leaders who have gone to Washington off of their hard work going to do for them. And it can't be same old, same old going back to the great society of LBJ because I don't think that's where people are right now. I, 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 Vlad, I agree with that. Here's what I hope that will come out of the narrative of Georgia. One, in the words of that Atlanta hip hop philosopher Andre 3000, the South has something to say. Uh, I hope the national media knows that. I hope people now understand that rural voters does not mean white voters, because sometimes when a narrative is written and we talk about rural America, we talk about rural parts of any individual state, we think only in terms of white rural voters. What are black voters in rural communities suit. In fact, Georgia will be a handsome example for a lot of people when you talk about an autopsy to show that, yes, Atlanta shows up, showed up in the metro parts, but rural black America, uh, rural black Georgia showed up too. And that's why you saw some of the margins you saw in this race. And thirdly, I hope people understand, and I hope the Democrats understand, that this is why we have to keep treating African-American voters, the most loyal voting bloc in this country, as an investment, not an expense. And we can't just show up and try to put an effort into the bloodstream when there's an election. It has to be a continuing, ongoing effort if we want to have continued success. Leslie, if you were advising the GOP in, in Georgia, for example, what would you tell them they need to do? So, so but there's a, certainly they need to look at the quality of the candidates. They need to look at um, you know who's in the farm system that they're moving up through uh, for state leadership, for federal elections. You know, for the possibility of being viable candidates, uh, and it can't just be a knee-jerk response. It needs to be really cultivating people that represent the community. You know, I wrote a book about this. Los Republicanos, why Hispanics and Republicans need each other 10 years ago. It's mm -hmm. the same mm -hmm. issues. Like, it's the same yeah, hasn't changed. question. The Republican Party had a way to go, and they went the other way. So, you know, it, it, the things we are talking about today, those themes of communities of color, and it's not just African American or Latino, Asian, it's, it, there's so many kind of interracial uh, and multi generational families that are, that, that are, the way America looks today, and the parties have a responsibility, to Antoine's point, to understand these needs. But both of these parties are still very competitive. These are not, you know, big washouts. These are very close elections. And because of that, uh, I think they have to continue to their engagement, understanding these communities, but keep the pressure on in terms of viability and, and staying connected, because it's, it's clearly lost one today, but tomorrow's a different day. All right, Antoine and Leslie, it's always great talking to both of you guys. Always a lot of insight. Thank, Thank you. you very much.